Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also O God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And so they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Maybe you've already tried it. If you haven't, I encourage you to do so as a part of your Easter celebration. What I'm talking about is laying side by side the accounts of this morning from the four Gospels. When you do that, you find a much varied set of stories about what happened that first Easter morning. There are different characters, different circumstances, different dialogues recorded in each. In fact, about the only thing they have in common is the empty tomb. Some have tried to explain those differences or to harmonize them, but I don't think it can be done. And to my mind, in fact, it's, it's really wonderful evidence that these stories were told by those first believers. They were connected to human communities and to human faith for years before they were finally written down for us. Mark's account, the one you just heard, as you may know, is the earliest of the four Gospels, and it is the leanest Easter story of them all. He tells us that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome dare to venture out early morning that Sabbath, arriving at Jesus' tomb 
at the crack of dawn. They come the day after the Sabbath, Sunday morning. They travel, either very bravely or clueless, since it clearly was not a good time for them to be associated with Jesus, who was just executed. I suspect of these women that it was bravery, really, that carried them out. They were on a mission. Jesus, of course, had been dead since Friday. They brought with them oil and spices, expecting to clean and anoint his battered, now decomposing body. Although, as Mark writes the gospel, Jesus told his followers three times about his impending death and resurrection, these women come expecting only the death. To them, his body still mattered. It was all that was left of the one they had followed and loved of the one who had so loved them. Others, all men, by the way, our daughter Kristen asked me to mention that to you. <laughs> Others had rejected him and betrayed him and abandoned him. But the ongoing devotion of these women would be shown in their attention to what remained of him. Perhaps you know or even are folks like them. When grief overwhelms, you just can't sit there. You've got to do something. I mean, bake a cake or clean the house or pick some flowers. These women had stayed with Jesus until the bitter and pitiful end. And now they come to do what they can, prepare him properly and decently for burial. In spite of what would be his grisly image and, pardon me, the stench, they knew that visiting the grave would help them work through the grief, provide some closure, maybe even offer a measure of peace. Or so they thought. They needn't have worried about moving that heavy stone at the grave entrance. When they got there, Mark said, it was wide open, surprise number one. And inside, surprise two, there was a young man, dressed in white, sitting on the right side. It's a fascinating piece of detail, isn't it? He tells them not to be alarmed. Yeah, right. He says that Jesus, who was crucified, had been raised. Shock number three, or perhaps a reminder of what Jesus said would happen. And then that young man sends them out to go and tell others, namely the disciples and Peter, that Jesus would go ahead of them to Galilee and will see them there. You heard what happened. They fled from the tomb in terror and said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. End of Mark's gospel. In fact, in the Greek word order, Mark literally ends, they were afraid for, stopping in mid-sentence, ending the entire book with a preposition. Mark obviously did not take my 10th grade composition class with Mrs. Nemec. <laughs> but consider what he tells us. The women came that morning expecting a dead body. But they're met with terrifying, amazing news. They come that day for closure and peace, but they're sent running. They're given a message to share, but they keep silent in fear. End of account. So, how goes it with you this morning? First, let me ask about your expectations. What drew you here on this lovely Sunday morning? Was it a sense of duty to make mama happy, maybe? Was it for the sights and sounds, the smells and bells? I mean, I'm trusting that you didn't come here for a corpse, but I know that to some, this old, old story told at Old Trinity might have just that connotation, as in ho-hum or P-U. Well, I may not be such a young man, but I am dressed in white. 
And whatever your expectations, I have got good news for you. The dead man has been raised, as he said. Get that, not just resuscitated, not rejuvenated, but raised, raised to a whole new kind of life. A life that death cannot destroy. Jesus now lives in such a way as to encounter you whenever we gather for word and meal. Jesus' new life overcomes the limitations of time so that he unites his people in heaven and on earth at this very table this morning. Jesus' new kind of life transcends space as well, joining believers in every place together. His one body, the church, alive and at work. I invite you to remember that, please, when the Opelinskis are in Africa these coming weeks. We are one in the Lord, truly. I don't know what you were expecting, but I'm here to tell you even more that Jesus goes ahead of you to home and school and workplace, wherever you came from. Galilee, after all, is where those fisher folk hailed from. It's where their homes and families and businesses were. The risen Jesus will meet you there to fill every part of your life, every aspect of your daily routine with his unconquerable love and his unending grace. Far from providing closure for those women, that Easter morning trip opened up a whole new world for them. Because Jesus lives, God is there for you, not just at temple or through religious hierarchy, but at every step, at every turn of your life. In Christ, God comes not to weigh you down with rules and regs, but God comes rather to free you for a life of love in Jesus' name. We know what it's like out there. The world is most certainly filled with signs of death and decay. We can't deny the reality of wars around the globe, of poverty in every land, of cemeteries in every town. But even more than that last breath kind of death, we know there are so many other little deaths that so many of us face each and every day. Challenges, hurts, broken relationships, discouragements, Jesus comes to them as well. Jesus breaks through them all, pushing aside whatever stones, breaking down whatever walls are in his way. By God, he is unstoppable, bestowing his peace, forgiving sinners, feeding and healing those in need, and making the grave not an end, but more a resting place along life's way. For risen Jesus, there are no longer insurmountable obstacles. There are no longer dead ends. Because God's love has triumphed. And God's love will make all things new. So I've asked why you came here this morning and what you were expecting. The final question from this man in white is, so what will you say about it? And what will you do about it when you leave here this morning? Scholars have long debated that odd ending of Mark's gospel in mid-sentence with a preposition of all things. Was it the case that Mark was distracted from his work or maybe attacked while he's there at the desk? Did the original scroll get torn off? Early on, several other endings were attempted to finish his gospel off so it would be like the others, one shorter, one longer. A good study Bible will show them to you. But to me, those other endings are not at all satisfying. I rather like this unfinished sentence, in fact. Gospel as literature ends there. But the story of Jesus most certainly does not. 
Jesus was raised so that Jesus can live for you and me, so that Jesus can live through you and me. The lives of countless generations have continued to write that gospel message with their very lives. And now, guess what? It's up to us to give it flesh and blood. In our second reading today, St. Paul talks about handing on what he received in Christ. That's been happening for 2,000 years now. Because we know the Church of Christ is always potentially one generation away from extinction, it's absolutely essential that every generation tells the story to the next, and more, that every, every generation demonstrates the power of that new life in Christ to the next. The women that first Easter Sunday were filled with good intentions. But you heard what happened. They were silenced by the terror and amazement. What's our excuse, I wonder? Newsweek's cover story this week is a chilling one, showing our church this day fractured into so many political forces, full of rhetoric, full of righteous self-judgment, full of anger. It depicts the church shriveling on the vine because it has so precious little grace and love. What are we to be about? For Christ's sake, we are called to share the good news of our experience this morning. The Jesus who lives is the one who challenged the smug religious leaders, who fed the hungry, healed the sick, welcomed sinners, broke down the barriers which had denigrated women, children, Gentiles, diseased, and poor people. Jesus welcomed them all with outstretched and loving arms as his sisters and brothers, as heirs of his kingdom, as people who are blessed and loved by God. That it's this Jesus who lives is a message our world, our country, our city need desperately to hear that the love of this Jesus continues is something that you and I need emphatically to demonstrate that his kingdom will triumph, needs most certainly to be the source of trust and hope for this old congregation, for our families, and most assuredly for our daily walk of life. Praise God! The gospel, good news of God's love in Christ, does not end with this book. It continues in the risen Lord for us and through us. Baptized into his death and resurrection, you and I are made into an Easter people. You and I are called each day to be people of light shining in a dark world to be people of hope, resolute in the face of despair, to be people of life in the midst of death, singing our alleluias even at the grave. Tell it, dear friends, in Jesus' holy name. Live it, people of God, as Jesus' risen body. Alleluia and amen.
pray for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. In abundant joy, we pray for all Christian assemblies united this morning at the empty tomb. We pray for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, and for Father John, for the congregation of Trinity Deaf, and for their servants Dee, Pastor Rick, and Kristen. Help us all to see you in places and people we do not expect and remove all fear from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. In humility, we pray for this planet, our earthly home. Heal what we have scarred and broken. Renew the face of the earth, that it may more truly reflect your glory. Lord, in your mercy. In hope and love, we pray for the nations of the world, especially those undergoing conflict or under oppressive regimes. By the light of the resurrection, Destroy the shroud that is cast over all peoples. Bring peace and relief from want to every country, city, village, and household. Lord, in your mercy. In hope, we pray you will wipe away the tears from all who weep. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, send your angels to watch over the vulnerable, sick, recuperating, and dying, Send your life-giving presence to our homebound members and to those other members we name before you, Rendell Wolf, Dave McCanny, Jan Rita Clemison, Nan Pottiger, Bill Davidson, Martha Tobias, Marie Swigert, Pastor Eckhart Grimm, Brian Trupp, Tom Schultz, Joan Goncher, Jane Sheets, Jane Yoakum, and those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. In grace, we pray for those joyfully gathered here by your spirit. Give us words to boldly proclaim Christ crucified and risen. Feed all guests here today your life word and heavenly feast. We remember in prayer this week our sisters and brothers in Christ. Larry, Nan, and Eric Pottiger. Lars and Leah Pottiger. Mary Ramos, Carlos and Carla Aponte, Charles and Sue Randazzo, and Jacob Reeves and family. Lord, in your mercy. In Thanksgiving, remember those who saw the Lord in life and now see him face to face, especially those most dear to us whom we name now. May their faithful witness inspire us to sing our Alleluia again and again. Lord, in your mercy. Passing from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from death to life, we commend to you, gracious and ever-living God, all for whom we pray. Amen. 